Hey everybody, it's Eric Balance coming to you with the Resilient Minds Podcast, where I feature beautiful entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and experts in their field, where they help us discover their X factor, their experience of life, only to discover how they were able to accomplish and find out their why factor, their big why, their purpose in life. So join me as we get to discover the beauty of our minds and how can we really continue to go after the biggest and most wildest dreams while we continue to pursue and manifest our greatest intelligence that comes from the heart. Also, if you haven't, go check out the new alignment course that I've created at www.ericbalance.com forward slash alignment, A-L-I-G-N-M-E-N-T. See you on the show. Welcome everybody to the Resilient Minds podcast. I'm excited today, you know, we're meeting with a fellow, I would say uh, light worker, I would say, you know, powerful speaker, I would say, you know, disruptor. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the most important thing is just fellow human being wanting to like really exponentially grow communication, vulnerability, um, you know, truth, intention, and, you know, growth for not just herself, but the people around her. And I think that that's how we drive change. And I just want to say first and foremost, thanks for coming on, Kim. It's really nice to meet you in person and, and connect deeper. And uh, I look forward to this episode together. How are you? I am, I'm doing great. I'm so uh, grateful to be here. So thank you. So grateful. Thank you. You know, for those of you that don't know Kim, um, you know, she's uh, really digitized her methodology. Let's call it the Kim, you call it the Kim Zoller. Is it Zoller or Zoller? Zoller. Zoller. Kim Zoller method. And it's literally a leadership method, you know, methodology rooted in neuroscience And it's really focused on the individual, the team, but most importantly, the leader's ability to tangibly implement skills that lead to true measurable and organizational change. And she's been committed to driving this positively um, around people, business, and her ability to really understand people and their needs and deliver these solutions has been extremely formidable and applicable. She's been featured on CNN and CNBC, New York Times, you name it, she's been there. It's beautiful to observe. But most importantly, I think that, you know, we have similar background from, you know, our Tony Robbins community, which is always nice to to connect deeper. And we have, I think, uh, a mission, you know, a mission um, here to serve in a bigger way. And it's great to to connect with like-minded individuals that are leading forward with change because I think we're here to uh, be change makers, a force for good, and, you know, uh, be excited about it. So welcome. And first, I want to understand, you know, where are you, what's exciting, where are you at right now? Tell me, you know, what's in your reality, what's, what's present? So what's most exciting, I I feel like I have so much exciting, which I'm, again, I'm so grateful for because I I believe that, you know, everything is just coming to us as it should and what's intended. And we all have this ability to just let it come in without resistance. And um, a week from today, a week from today, I'm doing a TED Talk in Dallas. And that- Congratulations. Thanks. That is, uh, I can't believe it's a week. And it's, um, it's scary because it's my life. It's like my real inside, my, my inner child, you know, to where I am today. And as I call her, my little Kim. And, um, and it's, it's called habit to awaken your potential and lead with your inner light. And it's something that I wanted to do. I mean, who doesn't want to do a TED Talk, right? And and so, especially if you're in this business of, of growth and potential, and you feel like you you feel like you really are on a mission, right? You feel like it's like you like God gave you this purpose, and now this is your purpose. So, I mean, I feel like that. And so, um, I finally last year 
I said, okay, enough, like thinking about it. And I, you know, I prime in the morning and I prime and I think about like, you know, my, what I want to accomplish. And it was always there. It was always one of those things. And then I finally said, you know what, um, you know, what, what is that saying? A, 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 a goal, a goal without a plan is just a dream. So I decided to put it into action and immediately called um, one person. Her name is Tilde uh, Guardo in Dallas, who I knew had done a TED, a TED Talk. And so she was like my first guide. And then I was presenting at this conference and I met this amazing individual named Eduardo Placer. And then he, I'm like, he is my guide. He is like my next, he is like, take me to the finish line. And, um, and he, his, it's, it's interesting, Eric, because his, his title in life is a, uh, he's a, he's a story doula. He pulls your story out of you. And it was the most incredible experience. And so um, here I am, you know, like a, a year later, really, um, having this opportunity and how it came to be was also like crazy incredible how everything just happens for us. Always, right? And I think that, you know, I'm I'm really curious to know because I think that I'm certain that, you know, this is probably, you know, something that, you know, you've been preparing for, you know, like you said, this mission has been coming up and, you know, focused and these, these TED Talks are always a great time for us to, you know, go out and really share our mission. Tell me what's something that making you feel scared about it right now? Like, is it just because like, there's this uncertainty about, you know, what's showing up or is there, you know, you know, fear of what people might think, or is it just like, you know, tell me, tell me what's, what's, what's showing up for you. So what's interesting is that, um, what's coming up for me, what's coming up for me is, is, um, where I'm, where I'm a little bit where I'm scared, but I know it's my truth is that this, I, I have lived and you can talk to if you, my clients go, I've been doing this for 30 years and I 30 plus years and I have clients from many years ago. And they say to me now, which is such a gift. They say, you're a different person. And, um, and I, a client, I had dinner with a client last week and she said to me, you used to just be so buttoned up. Everything about you had to be perfect. The way you looked, the way you dressed, the way you, you know, the way that you carried yourself, your conversations, what you shared with people, it just was so buttoned up. And in the last four years, you know, it's like you do growth and then you grow and then you grow. And I was always growing and learning like privately like with therapy or whatever, privately. And then I had my work life. And then I said, you know what? I have to combine them. So when you say what's scary, what is scary is that this is truly my story of decisions that I made in my personal life that no one knows about really, except the people who know. And, um, and I'm sharing like from the very beginning of my life, how I made decisions and it's, you know, and generational trauma and how that affects us and still loving, you know, still loving your, you know, my generational trauma really had to do with my, my dad, my birth father and stepmother. And yet I love, like, I have such love, right. For, for him, she just passed away, but such love for him because it is generational trauma and we don't pass on generational trauma unless it's happened to us. So when we really realize that we, that there's so much forgiveness in this. So what comes up for me is just this like, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm so blessed. Eric, I have people coming. There are people coming that I cannot believe they came. Like one client bought 10 tickets and another client, old client told me the other day that she and her husband are coming. And like all these people are coming and this is something that they don't know anything about, right? They just know like the Kim. Is, the yeah. So Sorry, so I just want, that's exactly what I was gonna kind of head into is like, is it is this something that the, the maybe... You know, because oftentimes, especially, you know, in the corporate world or, you know, as we continue to, you know, 
be part of this separation of this illusion because really illusion and so much, you know, you know, I'm in Dubai right now and I stick out like a sore thumb because I disrupt and challenge every status quo that has never existed. Right. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, when we are open into this vulnerable space and we, you know, I was just at a conference and, you know, I'm asking these difficult questions and, you know, people are like, you know, wow, I, I walk out of the room and people are asking me like, wow, where are these questions coming from? Like, because I feel about these questions are, are really about impacting society. And so it, it, it really creates a space of vulnerability and openness for everybody. So there's like, you know, you're really asking the speakers or the panelists the best part of how are they bringing their highest sense of self to the forefront. And so I think that, you know, is it something where because society for such a long period of time has constructed this like facade that we need to hide and now you're stepping into, you're spe spe stepping into like, past the veil and saying, Hey, like, listen, this is who I am. This is what I've been doing. This is what it's been about. And I'm like, you're letting kind of everybody pass the curtain and saying, here I am. And I want you to know, because this is how you're going to step into your power, your certainty, your ability. Tell me more about that. It's all about that. It is all about that. It's, yeah. you see, it's, it's, it's not about it's not about what has happened to us, right? It is about how do I take that and what do I learn from it? What can I do? And how do we step into something without feeling shame? Right? Because it's it's how do I how do I look at things in my life as instead of shameful, how do I look at them as this has really been my guide? And this is what makes me unique. And 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 if I realize that it makes me unique, I have something to teach. And I truly believe every single person has their own story and every single person has something to teach. And, and we, if we're wise enough, we can listen. And if we're wise enough, we can say, ah, you know what, that resonates with me. And maybe as I had a mentor at the very beginning of my career and um, one of my first like true mentor. And he used to say, why create mediocrity when we can copy genius? And I think about that and I think, you know what, if someone has experienced something, of course we have to have our own experiences, but why can't I listen to someone and say, you know what, that's so meaningful to me. And I can learn from that that someone else has experienced this, I'm not alone. And I can actually learn something from that. You know, one of the things in my TED talk that I'm constantly thinking about is that when I tell my story, the, the end of the TED talk is really about, is about what, what I did, what I did because of it. You know, like you fall flat and then and for me, you know, it was like I fell flat on my face of with certain things that happened. And again, no one knew that, right? Because I, on the outside, I was like, here I am. And on the inside, it was dark. And so then I had to figure out, because I knew so much, you know, Tony uses this quote and other people use this quote that that knowledge is power, that it's not, it, it's not power, that the execution is power. And for me, I had to figure out what I knew and what I was doing, and they were not, they were not uh, joined. And so I had to, to take all this knowledge that I have spent so many years, um, you know, learning and digging into and going into and saying, okay, Kim, now what do you do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to to create something new? What are you going to do to calm your mind and to calm your body and to help and to you know to truly be my best self and to align that inner and outer self which is it sounds so easy. Oh my gosh, Eric, it sounds so easy, but it's so hard and it takes so much work and it's so worth it, you know? I think that it you know, when we're willing to go through the, the deeper responsibility of building the relationship with ourself, um, it's, it's, it's only then that we get to start to understand our deeper relationship with the people around us because we've learned to, to, to cultivate the awareness. And so 
when we cultivate awareness, we set new intentions and then we can focus our attention on where we really want it. And that is, I think, a, a journey that all of us are unconsciously doing, you know, most of us are unconsciously doing um, and many of us are consciously starting to step into. And so yes. I think it's in the deeper levels of awareness where we start to uniquely understand that, hey, you know, why are we here and what's our soul's mission? Yes. That we start to listen to the teaching in front of each person because everybody is a, a teacher. And Lao Tzu, actually, he said this beautiful um, quote. He said, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And when That's the student right. is truly ready, the teacher disappears. And what that means is that when the, the student, the, the teacher disappears, it's actually appearing in each individual because you can start to pay attention closely enough to see a, and identify that the teacher is available in all circumstances. This is the great yes. mirror. Yeah. But you don't know that unless you do the work on yourself first. And so right. I think, you know, it's, it's funny, but you know, some people want to go out there and change the world. But the only thing they really have to go do is change themselves. And so with that being said, and your expression of like, you know, how are we going to go forward? And a lot of these leaders, especially what you do with organizational strategy and development, how do you define, you know, leadership, first of, first of all? So when I think, when I look at leadership today, being a real leader starts with ourselves. It starts with that we, it is, you know, it's very, again, it's so cliche. You walk the talk. But what I, what I know about leadership today, and it's, I think it's very different than when I started, what I know about leadership today is that we have to have inner, we have to have, we have to have inner skills. We have to, and it is skills, right? It's the inner skills to be able to quiet our mind, quiet our body, be able to actually listen to people. It isn't about you know, what I'm putting out, what I'm putting out, it is about actually just stopping and listening to hear what is needed in this moment, what is needed in my strategy in the long term. And in order to do to find that, I need to stop and listen to myself first. And, um, and leadership today is, is their skills, they're, they are skills, and they are learned. And ultimately, in order to be a leader, you have to have someone who's truly following. And in order to have a true follower, you have to truly listen because every single person wants to be cared for. Every single person wants to matter in someone else's eyes. So it's not a leader. I can, I have, you have different leaders. You have different mentors. I mean, I have many mentors who don't know my name right? We, I mean, it could be whether it's Tony Robbins or it's Bob Proctor or it's, it's, um, I mean, there's so many, Rumi, what, you know, so many people that I read, that I listen to, that I look at, Dale Carnegie, I mean, just so many, right? They don't know my name, if they're even alive. Um, but, the, and so they are leaders in a different sense. They are leaders because I look at what they do and what they've said. And I say that, affects me. I can do something with that. When I think about the leaders who I are in my life, who do know my name, they, if they don't care about me, then they're not a leader to me. I cannot follow them. So I think that there's aspects. I don't know if that answered your question. There are different aspects of different types of leaders and they're all good. They're all good. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you discern, I mean, I, I, t I totally understand what you're saying, especially when it, you know, especially from, you know, these, these, these teachers that have, you know, been, have wrote, written books, left legacies behind. And, you know, then the current ones that are, you know, curating their legacies as we speak. Right. Uh, I think that there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a finesse of getting to know oneself. And, and as you do that, you actually start to leave behind a legacy. So these are the, the current leaders that you, what I'm hearing is what you're talking about. And so when you're, you know, looking at your experience of life and how it's continued to, you know, emerge and develop, what has been kind of a key identifier for yourself um, in actualizing this leadership within you? 
Um, okay, so I want to make sure I hear your question right. A leader to my t a leader in my life overall. Yeah. So, so what was there? What was the experience that helped you identify you yourself as a leader so that you can contribute to your purpose? Yeah, that's such a good question because. Here's the thing, you know, when I started my business, I was so young, first of all, and there were people, you know, my, I had employees and I was a leader, right? But I don't think I was a very good leader at all. I mean, I just, I had, I had a vision and I knew what I wanted to do and I needed people to execute and do those things so that I could fulfill what I was doing. And I was great on the outside and not great in in house. I just wasn't. I didn't have the skills to to lead. So through my team, this is from an outside point of view. Through my through my own team, saying, you know, Kim, because we used to do these things on a continual basis, like a check in at least once a year. How are we doing? And what do I? How you know what what am I not seeing? What are my blind spots? And I'll tell you, Eric, that, you know, um, I had a, a, an employee who said to me, you know, Kim, it's really hard working for you. And I said, you know, why? And she said, you're just like up and down. You're intense. And then you want to be everyone's best friend. And it doesn't work that way because when you're so intense, you stress every single person out. And that was for me. And she said, we don't, we don't, I don't know if I, you know, sometimes I don't know if I want to work here. And for me, that was like, an, like such a, you know, like, oh, you know, one of those things that just hit me in such a way that I said, oh my gosh, I have, here I am teaching these things and I'm not exhibiting them. And that is not good. So I then said, pivotal moment, do something about it, Kim, figure out how to become a better leader. And that was from an it, you know, from my house, so to speak, from a work standpoint. And I started building, building, building. So the skills I was teaching, I started learning and learning and then called mentors and said, who are, are really good leaders and said, I need help and I need to get better. And again, I just started practice because it's practice over and over and over again and created systems in my office that changed me as that leader. And then, you know, then we get to the personal side again, which is a, it's, it is different because you can act any way on the outside, but if you're putting your head on the pillow at night and you're thinking, oh my gosh, uh, again, whether it translates into shame or blame, or, you know, for me, a lot of it was just is, is in my own internal fears, my own internal shame of certain things. And then I thought, okay, I I have to lead myself. I have to lead myself. And it really, for me, Eric, it was a moment of, I couldn't breathe. And again, no one on the outside knew that, but inside I just couldn't breathe. And I almost felt that there were times that I was like in a fishbowl where mm -hmm. I was going out and I could see everyone and I could, and, and yet I just felt like everything was sort of happening around me. I was not a part of it. And I just knew that I had to do something. So, um, so I, I, I really created my own methodology, which is a big part of my TED talk actually. So it's really exciting of my own methodology of, 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 of staying present. It's actually called STAR and it's, it's staying present and tuning in and being in an abundance mindset and learning how to rise because that truly for me became, that's how I truly became, I think my own inner outer leader, going back to your question. And I love this because this philosophy of becoming the, your own star, you know? It is, you, it is, and it has to come. It has to come from within. It's all about what's coming from within. So when you talk about the STAR method, um, you know, methodology, can you take us through that piece by piece? I would love to. All yeah. right. So, um, all right. So S, S is stay present. And um, a big part of that is that, you know, when you look at all the studies that have been done, there's an article or a study that was done called um, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And that study in particular, um, there are other studies, but that study in particular said that 47% of our time, 
our minds are neither here. They are there and they're, they're not here. They're in the past and they're in the future. And what happens is that when it's future, it either is fear or it is remembering something. So it's future looking, thinking about what I want in the past that was good, but I'm not present. So I'm not enjoying anything in the present. I'm just thinking about what was past that was good or what was past that was bad. Then I go into fear. So all of this is happening. And the fact is, is that even on this conversation, you know, are we present? Are you truly present? And am I truly present? Because it's, you can miss it in a heartbeat. And so for me, walking through that, how do you stay present? Well, really the only thing that ultimately rewires, our brains are rewiring all the time. The only thing that really rewires our brains in a way to keep us present is mindfulness and meditation. And we know that like it's, you know, and I'm not, you Can know, I I'm challenge not you here. I need to challenge you here. I'm sorry, because mindfulness literally in the language of mindfulness takes, a, it, it creates a capacity of keeping our mind full. And so, so I'm gonna I always say, I'm gonna challenge I, you. <laughs> I always say, I always say here based off of this, you know, it's actually about losing our mind and being back in the feeling of our body and bringing this essence of presence. And so as much as I agree, you know, I just, I just think that there's a, you know, the old adage and what the language is and, and, the, and, and what, you know, society has dictated with mindset and mindful, it actually creates uh, like, it's like, you know, abracadabra speak into existence, right? So we're literally speaking into existence that we have to have a full mind or a set mind when in actuality, what we want is to be mindless and present. So I just so, want to, I just want to ask you here. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I want you to think about this. I want you to take the word mindful and mindfulness, right? And, um, and I want you to cut it, that one of the L's out. And it is mindful. It is my, it, it is being mindful, and and being that as much as you possibly can. So it is not mindful with a double L. It is one L, and it is I am being mindful in this moment. And so I agree with you. We're saying exactly the same thing. And, in, and I understand I where you're coming from. And I don't and think I do it's. Yeah, and and I That's and I love what I love what you're saying too. I love what you're saying too. I think that um, I think the key, and I'll go back to the meditation part. I think the key, even with meditation and let's say mindfulness with either spelling, right? It is here's the thing about losing our mind, or or it, it is it is actually. For me, I think that where most people get so caught up is that they do feel like, oh my gosh, I can't get rid of the thoughts. So they get so stressed out about it. And the fact is that really isn't meditation. Meditation is being able to, in every moment, realize that the thought is coming in and not getting caught up in it, right? And so I always say to groups that I work with that you, that if every time, if you're meditating, your mind is going nuts. Every time you notice that you're going nuts, like it's going somewhere else, every time you notice that, that is like the biggest victory. That is like the aha, right? Like, oh my gosh, I caught it. Ah, uh, where am I? What is my bum doing on this chair or this seat? What are my feet doing on this floor? And so it's coming back to that space of, wait, I don't have to believe it. Just because it's a thought, I don't have to go there. So I think that I hear even what, what you're saying, I think we have to be so careful in knowing that, and especially for people who are like, I cannot meditate, I cannot meditate. And I have to say like, in, with no judgment, it's BS. There is no such thing as cannot meditate. What it is, is that a person feels like they're supposed to be in like this la la land nirvana and it just isn't you know it isn't realistic for the majority of people unless you're a master meditator and even a master meditator is just constantly coming back to their breath 
noticing coming back, noticing coming back. Is it, do you think it's possible to meditate in the current present moment, like right now? Or do yeah, you think, sure. yeah, okay. So is it possible, is it safe to say that somebody that is present is, is a master meditator? Uh, that's a good question. I think that maybe, I think, yes, I think the more present we are, we get better and better when I, you know, I'm referring to people who really meditate a hundred, um, hours, they, they, what is it? A hundred hours, um, a year, I, or what, you know, there's where they're, they're the, all, the people who they've actually, like some of these people who they've studied, Pima Chadron, you know, some of the people who actually are, they've, they've really looked at their brains. So, um, yeah, like so suddenly I'm a teacher. I understand what you're saying. I just think that there's actually a deeper mechanism that can allow us to go deeper um, through not just the breath, because the breath and the breath holds um, are great ways to create this rewiring um, alchemical process. Um, I just want to, I just, I'm just curious to know more about, I think that there is something about allowing that physical existence to come into a current present moment, because the study actually is in the present moment and, and, right. and, and understanding that these present pieces of being yeah. with one another as, as like leaders, as communication, as really finessing and, and finding solutions, it comes from paying attention to one another right. in the present. Right. 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 Yeah. So it's, it's, it's even in that moment, exactly. It's, it, that's what it is. It's just being present. So I think that what happens, especially when we're stressed or, um, you know, when we go into that state of anxiety or we start telling stories or we're ruminating um, about things or we create, you know, that someone did something to me, um, you know, it could be anything like you walking in a grocery store and someone doesn't look at you, you say hi, someone doesn't say hi, and then you go into your head like, my gosh, why didn't they say hi? It is in that moment of being present with yourself, of not, of realizing, oh yeah, that is a story. Oh yeah, that is a thought. Oh yeah, I can let that go. Or being in this moment with us and you say something and it generates a thought for me. And then I start going down that track of what the thought is and then realizing that I just missed a minute with you. So um, I think that, I think that if our goal, right, our goal is to live every moment mindfully, if we can, or my, or being present, whatever we want to say, oh my gosh, we're going to get caught up on semantics, but no. um, I, I really don't think it's semantics. I really think there's a, there's a, there's a key, there's a, a key initiative based off of language yes. that allows us to create a vibrational resonance that affects yeah. the current present moment. Right. And with these language, you know, that has been conditioned and passed down by propaganda or experience or societal belief systems, we actually have a responsibility to, to pay attention. And they're not right. just semantics because sure. although language is only 7% of our, our communication, it's the actualization of what that piece of information is curating in front of the person that's receiving it sure. and so if we're really paying attention or mindless or mindful of, of the en energy then we we need to be sensitive of the information that is actualizing inside of another person's um reality you know yeah, you're, so, you're so right you're so right and our own right and our own so yeah. um there uh i don't know if you've um um if you've heard of, so I, I, there's a, there, the, the Rebbe, I don't know if you've ever read that book or if you've seen it, it's a, he was the Chabad Rebbe and he was, he was like one of the most, one of the first religious, he, he won a Nobel prize. And one of the things that he said was, and I love this and it goes back. I mean, please, the States like so far back, but exactly what you're saying and exactly what you're saying in that, it is so much the words that we use. And, you know, he used to use these examples of like, um, when you were even at work, if something, you know, people say there's a deadline, that he would say there's, it's not a deadline, it's a due date. You know, it's like, it, those words are so important that we use. Um, 
I was listening to something yesterday and someone kept saying, it's so hard. It's so hard to do this. It's so hard to do that. And yeah, the more you say it, the harder it's going to be because you're putting those words into, into, into the present. You're putting them into our minds. We're putting them into what, what truly is. So I, I'm with you 100% on, on that. I am. So I'm going to have to really think about <laughs> it. Just, it's just something, to, something to pay attention to. And I think that this is the fun part, right? Especially when you're going and, and, you know, again, you're, I mean, you're having this conversation or this amazing, beautiful tech talk next week, you know, which I'm really excited for, but just something to like, especially when you're influencing a whole room, right? You're, you're going to influence yeah. a whole room with your story. And so some of these things, it gives you an opportunity to say, Hey, you know, like I was challenged by my dear friend, you know, I don't know. I mean, you can, you get to take what you want, you know, at the end of the day, it's your reality. You get to choose what you, what you want For to sure. see. And For it's sure. so beautiful because you're receiving and also I'm sharing and we're, we're just being, this is the dance. You see, this is the dance. And this is what I'm grateful for because you're also so beautiful in the way that you're receiving. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely, it's funny because I'm, de you know, it is, it's so, it, the words are important and how we take them. I was thinking about my talk. I don't think I use the word mindful. I, I use, so now I'm definitely not going to use it, even if I was. And um, I do talk about meditation. I do talk about meditation. I, and I, I talk about that for me, what I did, like in that star practice, what I did was take me back I, to that, by the way, because I just want to keep going with the star practice because yeah, I think it's yeah, important yeah. just for anybody that's listening. Um, thank you. Um, so, and you know, I have we created a little a little pocket card, so I could send it to you afterwards, a fence one uh, of mm -hmm. the of the practice. So, um, so the 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 S part, you know, the staying present for me when I was all over the place, I did, I, I did all this research and I was like, I gotta, I gotta find an app that works for me, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is purely, the funny thing is, is that in college, like so many years ago, I had taken a meditation class. And again, just, I knew, I know so much about meditation, did not practice every day. So I was like, okay, I know this, now I need to do it. So I, I found an app and at the beginning I committed to 10 minutes a day and that's all I did because that's what I could do. And, you know, obviously over time it has built and um, the key is that I want people to know that they can do it. They can do it. It's not, it's not something that's not attainable to them. It is something very attainable and it's very, um, it's very easy actually once you just let that be and let it come in and, and stop resisting it. So that's the S. And then the T is tune in. And what I equate this to is an instrument that, you know, if you look at a musician, they are constantly tuning an instrument, their instrument. So here's our instrument and people aren't tuning it. And they're not thinking about it. Even for people, even like, I, like I'm a big exerciser and I love exercise. And I teach spinning. I love exercise. I, that's tuning one piece of yourself. It's my body. It's tuning my body. So it's it's what what why are why are we paying attention to tuning into our whole selves? And exactly. so the tuning is tuning our own instruments. So really, that we are in harmony with ourselves in the world. And for me, it starts the minute I wake up. I literally wake up. I touch my I my alarm goes off or if it doesn't, I wake up and I immediately touch my toes and say, welcome to the best day of your life. Mm -hmm. And I, and I do that every single day. And then I immediately think about three very specific things that I'm grateful for in the last 24 hours. And sometimes I have to think like, what did I do yesterday? What did I do? Because we're so busy thinking about what's to be that we that we're not we're not taking the moment to just say I'm so grateful, and what we've learned, um, you know, that there there was a study that was done. It's it's a fascinating study about gratitude, and about really firing certain places in the brain to look for positivity, and 
the, the the gist of the study was basically that if people are like, I'm so grateful, I'm grateful for my health, I'm grateful for my home, I'm grateful that after after a certain amount of days, generally three, five days, you know, by 30 days, your mind's not even thinking about it. It's just saying it. So there's nothing that fires up, which is why it's so important to be specific. So that is, um, you know, that for me in tuning in, that's one thing that I do. Well, two things. And the other thing that I tune into is that every time I feel a little piece of overwhelm or stress, and I do, and I don't use that word, by the way, I do not ever say that I'm overwhelmed. I say that I'm queen of my calendar. I am queen of my life because I, you know, otherwise there's, and how grateful are we that we have a lot of stuff going on. So when I do feel like that, I have, I, I have a method for myself that I look down at my feet. I'm, I'm like, I am grounded. And I say to myself, I am here now. And in this moment, I can handle anything. And for me, that was a life changer, especially when I did feel like I was underwater because I didn't know how I was going to do the next five minutes or 10 minutes. And, um, and again, everyone has their story. So people might look at me and say, what, I didn't know this about her or gosh, I would never have known this. And so we all, we all have those moments, right? And, and those, for me, that tuning in is incredibly important. I think that, you know, the, 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 the grounding that you're referring to or the tuning in into the, into it. Um, I think that a lot of people, you know, just to, to have this sense of gratitude, it's, it's often forgot. It's very limited. Yes. And, and, you know, it's like, even how present are you are when you're, you and you're having lunch or breakfast to your food. Yeah. And this, this is, a, this is like the essential part of grounding is having a great meal to eat and being right. grateful for it. Right. And so I think that this is uh, something that is often forgotten. It's like, you know, how do we do we take a moment for, you know, honoring what we're about to eat or do we just kind of shove, you know, everything down our throats? And, you know, this is this is a, a grateful moment to be able to fuel your body, to take care of your temple, um, to look after, you know, the, the gifts that have been given us through, you know, these these meaningful foods and the way that they've been curated or care catered to us and things like this and th these are moments of gratitude that you know you can have in each moment yeah. you know i always say life yeah. is an altar and each moment is a prayer and uh if we identify with each moment as a prayer and each moment we can be grateful for so you know just something to, 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 to and i love that you're talking about the toes and the groundedness and the connectedness because it, it really is about honoring our body yeah, I love that. I love that. You made me think about something that my son, my I think both of them do it, but my son Benji really started this where before, um, before well, th there's a prayer that before, you know, we eat. Um, he also, I love this. He literally stops and he takes the food and he looks at it and he smiles. And I don't, he learned it from someone. I have no idea. Um, but I love that because number one, it makes everyone else just stop and smile. And it's like in that moment, that physical motion of like, I am so grateful and happy, you know, and what that does to his, and you know, his hormones actually, and everything that's happening as he takes in that food is and as a I result, think, it, it also, it also impacts everybody because he's expressing his gratitude. Yes. So they'll feel then the, their level of residence and gratitude. And I think that's special because it he's is. actually, he's actually influencing so many people by just being himself. Yeah. And I love this, it. This is, this is the beauty of just a being of just being who we are rather than needing to prove ourselves or needing to go and do anything. People always say, what do you do? What do you do? Well, no, let's just be. And then we can yeah. understand that we, we are enough and we have nothing to prove. Yeah, for a hundred percent, hundred percent. It is. It's amazing how we can influence people without even, without even really, you know, realizing it. So um, yeah, so that's the tuning in. And then my next thing is the A, the abundance. 
and yeah. living in an abundance mindset and what that actually means. And, you know, I, I have to tell you for many, many years, again, I thought, oh my gosh, I live in, I'm so grateful and I live in abundance. And actually I really wasn't because I was living a little bit in a scarcity mindset of like, oh my gosh, what could go wrong? And for me in particular it was relationships, but what could go wrong in this relationship? Or I would imagine certain things and like, how could it be this way? And I would imagine certain things. And the funny thing is, Eric, is that generally those things happen. Um, or, you know, thinking about, it could be anything. It could be money. It could be thinking about a bill and being so fixated on the bill, which is such scarcity mindset, as opposed to money comes easily and freely and, and it will come. And it could be anything, my health, my wealth, what, whatever it is. And so when we're in scarcity, whether we realize it or not, you know, cortisol, that stress hormone just increases so much. So you're constantly looking at things from the outside to make you feel good as opposed to inside. And for me, what I talk about with abundance is that it is, it is really, it is stopping and, um, and again, going through those different practices and it's, you know, and tuning in and looking for what is right, what is right in the situation and asking yourself those questions, right? Like how in this moment, how, how can I appreciate even more of the perfection of this moment? And mm -hmm. when things are, when things are not good, you know, like something happens or someone says something, I say to myself, how can I appreciate God's perfection in this moment even more? Because this, that person just said something or did something for me, for me to either look in or for me to realize something. So what is it? And when we, when we look at things like that, then what it does is it actually creates the opposite of, of, of what you're releasing in your body. So we're really at that point releasing neurotransmitters like, like dopamine and serotonin that actually feed us from the inside out mm -hmm. as opposed to the outside in. And I think that that the key, again, when you go through the steps, it's very difficult to live in an abundance mindset when you're not present, when you're not tuning in. And then the by last is R, you rise. And that we are, we, we as human beings have a choice every single day. And we're habitual beings. And so in order to step out of that, we have this opportunity to make that choice to say, how do I rise above this? Well, I've gone through these steps. Now, what do I do? If I go into my old pattern, it's an old pattern and I realize it. So what can I do it's above it? Bless you. So it's, you know, it's a, um, um, it's a choice. It's a choice to step out of an old narrative and into a new one. It's a choice to create new neural pathways by doing it over and over and over. I heard a great analogy yesterday about imagining that you're, you step out of your, your you wake up, you step out in every day and you walk across a field of tall grass. And every day you walk, keep walking that same route, that same route, that eventually that grass goes lower and lower and lower. And that is what we're doing with, with habits. We're creating new habits. So where the grass was so tall, now that becomes so easy because it is a new pathway in our brain. And, um, and that's, that's what it's about. And I feel like so crazy grateful that it took some it. Really shitty things in my life to create such greatness, you know, and they, and then I think about it and they weren't shitty at all. They were just like things. It was life happening all for me and the way that, you know, was intended. I love it. I think that, you know, this is it is, you know, seeing the gratitude in, in all of it and then really becoming the star of your own life. And I think that that's right. always, I always say, you know, like, how can you be the wonder of your own life? You know, you know, for, forget the eight wonders of the world, you know, be the <laughs> ninth, like, right. be the eleventh, be the hundredth, be the million, yeah. you know, because you are the wonder of your own world. And so I think that, that this is a key philosophy that I really, you know, share about. And I loved how you really illuminated like music and, and, you know, I always say the artistic expression, we get to paint the brush of our life every single day. Yes. 
So if, who are, if, we, if we step into ourselves as being the art of our life, the artistic expression or the curator of our life, we step into the philosophy and we understand that we take more responsibility of it. We so do. I love, I, I love this, this analogy. I think it's a very important methodology. And I think it's something that a lot of people are, are benefiting already from and, and more importantly, going to benefit even more. I'd love to know if uh, anybody wants to kind of know more about you, hear more about what you're up to, uh, read anything that you've written, you know, where can they find more information, how they can con connect with you? Uh, so yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm on Instagram. It's Kim Zoller Method. And um, I'm on Facebook, just Kim Zoller. I have a professional page. Um, I also have a personal page that uh, anyone can connect. Um, you can go to our website, which is always being redone, um, that you can know more about, about me and about us. And you can either do that through the Kim Zoller, it's kimzollermethod.com or id360inc.com, which is my, uh, which is, is, is one of, uh, you know, the, uh, one of my companies. So, um, yeah. And I have a last question before we go. Um, what, if you had three days left to live, what would you do? Oh my gosh. Well, I would surround myself with my family and my friends. That's what I would do. I would just gather them. You know, Eric, I had a really bad accident last year and um, a woman went into me and literally just like was probably this far away from killing me. And it took them like an hour to get me out of my car. It was incredibly scary. And, um, you know, thank God, all I had was a really bad concussion, but I literally got out of the car. I filmed it. My kids, as I said, live in Israel. I filmed it. I, I said, this is what happened. I am fine. And I will be on a plane within three days. And I got on a plane and I went to see my children. It's going to make me cry. And I was like, that is only what that's important. That was the only important thing. So for me, it is just being surrounded. And I feel so blessed that I have these incredible children and incredible family, incredible friends. You know, we water our friends and our family every day, like a garden. And when we do that, we have a beautiful flower garden. And that's how I feel. I love it. And I think that, you know, this is the most beautiful thing. If we start seeing every human being as our family, we can start probably, you know, living in this community, common unity around the world. So yeah. I just want to say thank you for you. Thank you for being such an amazing uh, individual doing such amazing work. Is there any last words you want to share? I just want to thank you. You are incredible. You are a genuine, beautiful soul. So I'm, I mean, I had no idea where this was going to go and I just love you so much. You're just amazing. You. You're amazing. Yeah. And you can only, I can, you can only see what, only what you have inside of you. So bless your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Hey everyone. And thank you so much for listening to the resilient minds. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please make sure to go comment and like, and follow us on iTunes or Spotify and make sure, please make sure that if you really love this, to share this episode and make sure that you're inviting all your friends to like it as we continue to unfold what the beauty of our minds does. More importantly, how powerful our heart level of intelligence can be when we combine our heart and our brain together. And more importantly, check out the alignment course that I've created. It's seriously there for you to take advantage of at www.ericbalance.com forward slash alignment. See you on the next show.